Good afternoon and welcome to session F2 titled FEMA Hazard Mitigation Programs and Requirements. My name is Steve Ferryman. I'm the State Hazard Mitigation Officer from Ohio. I'm also the, uh, on the Board of Directors for ASFBM as the Region 5 representative. We have a great presentation lined up for you today. Before we get started, uh, just a word from our sponsor, CDM Smith. At CDM Smith, we are committed to making a difference for our clients, our people, our communities, and our world. Since 1947, we have been solving the most complex environmental and infrastructure challenges. Whether it's making every precious drop of water count through safe supplies, reliable conveyance and sustainable reuse, designing remediation systems and restoring ecosystems, or leveraging emerging technologies and multimodal strategies to connect people, places, and goods. We've been giving back. We are global citizens committed to helping communities, our own and those in need around the world. And perhaps most importantly, we've been making the world a bit better along the way. We're CDM Smith, and we can't wait to work with you. Welcome back, and thank you, CDM, for your sponsorship of this uh, session. Our first presenter is Kai Edlakian, and the title of his presentation is Overview of FEMA's Hazard Mitigation Assistance Grant Programs 2021, What Applicants Should Know. Kai Edlaki is the Deputy Division Director of Hazard Mitigation Assistance at the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Prior to this appointment, Mr. Laki has served as the Deputy Division Director for Risk Reduction from 2012 and has also held the position of Acting Deputy Assistant Administrator for FEMA's Recovery Division. Mr. Laki has over 10 years experience in emergency management at the federal level and in the private sector. As Deputy Division Director, Mr. Laki oversees the administration of over $1 billion annually in hazard mitigation grants, including PDM, BRIC, FMA, and HMGP. In the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy and Maria, Mr. Lockia has led the implementation of FEMA's largest mitigation portfolio. Mr. Lockia holds a master's of science degree from MIT. He is a registered architect in New York and Florida, certified field plan manager and lead accredited professional. He completed postgraduate studies at Harvard's National Preparedness Leadership Institute and University of Virginia's Darden School of Business. He is an OPM certified member of the Senior Executive Service. And with that, we'll turn it over uh, to, Lakia, uh, to, to Kaya Lakia. And if you have uh, questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat. Take it away, Kaya. Good afternoon, my name is Kai Lakhi and I'm the Deputy for Hazard Mitigation Assistance at FEMA. And today I will be providing you all an overview of FEMA's HMA grant programs, which includes a summary of the survey applications we received for our 2020 annual grant cycle, uh, namely the BRIC and the FMA programs. Uh, FEMA's Hazard Mitigation Division, HMA, supports states, locals, tribes, territories to reduce nationwide vulnerabilities to disasters and natural hazards. Our vision is to be a driver for community resilience through partnerships and mitigation investments. And our mission is to reduce disaster suffering. Next slide, please. The agenda for today, uh, I will give a brief overview for HMA programs, which most of you are familiar with, and I don't intend spending a lot of time there. Uh, the second bullet is something I know you all are anxious to learn a little bit more about and that is how we fared with our BRIC and our FMA programs for 2020. Um, third, uh, we'll share uh, some of the tips for success and the timeline of where we are. And lastly, we'd like to close with where we are with FEMA strategic direction. Next, please. So brief overview, as you are aware, uh, we provide mitigation funding through both uh, the HMA grant programs as well as the public assistance uh, programs. And um, they comprise of uh, starting from left to right, uh, the FMA program, 
whose primary function is to fund flood mitigation assistance programs. Um, the PDM program, which was sunset, and that gave rise last year to the BRIC program shown there in green. Um, the HMGP program, which uh, in terms of dollar value is the largest program currently, and it's a disaster program, as is the HMGP post fire, which is also a disaster program. Lastly, the public assistance program, many of you may know colloquially as the 406 program. Next, please. In 2020, we have a great story to tell. We obligated more than $1.3 billion in HMA assistance and public assistance mitigation. Um, as you see in the pie chart, it's broken out in the following ways. 44%, uh, slightly over 44%, was awarded through the HMGP or roughly 582 million. Um, next largest piece there was the public assistance program, which awarded nearly 432 million, um, followed by the PDM program at 178, um, FMA program in blue there with 107 million, and lastly the HMGP post fire at roughly 15 million dollars. As you can see, not included on this list is the BRIC program, and we will talk about that in terms of the FY20 grant application. Next, please. So the most important part of the story is, as you know, the 2018 DRRA, the Disaster Reform Recovery Act, authorized FEMA to create a pre-disaster hazard mitigation program uh, known as BRIC and to support greater investments in mitigation plannings and projects before a disaster occurs. Now that is key and we were very, um, what was very important to us as an agency was to make sure that we were responsive to the needs of the community. Um, to support the development of the BRIC program, we ensured firstly that we fulfill Congress's intent in thoughtfully designing and implementing the program. Uh, second, we sought to provide transparency around the BRIC development process. And lastly, we also sought to offer stakeholders an opportunity to share their experiences and opinion. Um, as many of you are aware, and thank you for participating in this, we held an, a comprehensive um, stakeholder engagement um, and comments and review. Uh, as many of you are aware, both formal and informal comments uh, totaled uh, over 5,500, uh, which was uh, more than any uh, number of comments which the program which any program in FEMA has received and of a comprehensive stakeholder engagement in 2019 included several webinars which many of you participated in as well. So how did we take this information into account as we designed the BRIC program? Um, the feedback was in, was used to inform the BRIC policy, influence FEMA's development of the BRIC NOFOs, and as you know, we encourage public infrastructure projects, increase projects that mitigate risks to more than one lifelines, um, promote projects that incorporate nature-based solutions. And lastly, we wanted to continue emphasizing adoption and enforcement of modern disaster resistant building codes. Uh, the NOFO, as you know, was posted on August 4th of 2020 and um, 700 million was collectively available for both of these programs, 500 million for BRIC and 200 million for FMA. So in the next few slides, I will share with you how we did in terms of the applications received. Next, please. So on the BRIC, uh, great story here again. Uh, as you may recall, I just mentioned we had 500 million available and we received projects for 3.6 billion nationwide, uh, with total project costs exceeding five and a half billion. Uh, the number of sub-applications we received was 991. Um, number of structures to be mitigated was 1521. Uh, the great story about the 991 applications also was that of those 991, we received applications from 98 small and impoverished communities as well, which as you can see is nearly 10% of the total number of sub applications received. We are committed to delivering our programs with equity in mind, and this increase in applications from small and impoverished communities is a great sign. 
Looking at the geography, uh, the map on the right, uh, we can also see that 53 states and territories applied for BRIC. And of these 53, 25 states apply, submitted projects for 50 million or more federal share. Five states submitted projects with over 200 million in federal share. And those states are California, New Jersey, New York, Texas, and Virginia. The first year of the BRIC saw also significant participation from tribes. Um, 73 sub applications requested an estimated 22.9 million in funding. Next, please. So in terms of project types, um, the BRIC, uh, the five top project types by the amount of federal share requested was flood control projects, which totaled nearly 1.3 billion uh, of the 3.6 received. Um, utility and infrastructure projects came next, uh, safe rooms and shelters, retrofits, and lastly, mitigation reconstruction. In terms of types of number of sub applications, not just dollars, um, again, understandably, flood control came the highest, uh, followed by plan updates, utility and infrastructure protection, um, engineering, environmental feasibility, and BCA analysis, and finally, generators. Next, please. With FMA, as in prior years, our priority remains to fund RL and SRL properties, and we received against the 200 million available that we had um, received projects worth 398 million or nearly twice as much. Not unusual and it follows a trend which we have seen over the last few years as well. The number of sub applications we received was 236 and um, it totaled um, total project costs uh, was exceeded 477 million. In terms of the geographic distribution, we received FMA applications from 29 states and territories uh, for FMA, including one tribe, and three states submitted projects with 50 million or more federal share. Eight states, project, eight states submitted projects with over 10 million in federal share, Louisiana, North Carolina, North Dakota, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Texas, and Virginia. A total of 27 states or tribes, uh, I'm sorry, 27 states or territories did not submit FMA sub applications for this fiscal year. Next, please. In terms of types of projects received, is a great story as well, and not uh, surprisingly, um, elevations, flood control, and acquisitions continue to take the major uh, types of projects which we have received under the FMA and it follows a trend which we have seen over the last few years. Uh, stabilization and res restoration projects were also received as were a few relocation projects. The top five projects by the number of sub applications closely parallels the dollars received. Um, elevations acquisitions um, are followed by flood control, uh, engineering environmental feasibility and benefit cost analysis, and lastly, mitigation reconstruction, which had 11 projects of the type received. Next, please. So where are we and where are we going? The red arrow indicates where we currently are, and we are in this time frame where we are reviewing the applications. And um, in this process, as you know, if you look at the arrow immediately to the left, our application period was open from September 2020 to January 2021. And uh, as part of our review process, we went through um, what's known as an eligibility and completeness review. Um, after that was concluded, we conducted a virtual national review panel to score sub applications. Uh, these panels increased transparency into the decision making process while enhancing partnership among all the panelists. The virtual panels ran from March 8th through April 2nd. And once that was concluded, we forwarded the results to the National Technical Review, which is where we are currently. The Technical Review team is currently ranking and selecting the projects, and we hope to make the announcements later this summer. The next year, uh, the FY21 NOFO cycle will begin 
uh, as per prior years, sometime in the August or September timeframe. Uh, one of the things which is important, and we have heard from all of you, is that a consistent grant cycle uh, timeframe really helps, and that's what we are aiming for. Next, please. So what are some of the tips and for success in, uh, in uh, submitting your applications as we head for 2021? Um, this is an area which I will just give you some of the highlights and then rely on my colleagues following me to give you some greater details and tips and tricks in terms of maximizing your, your uh, award possibilities. Um, any HMA grant program, including those funded by BRIC, uh, there are some key elements to consider. Uh, risk reduction, leverage mitigation best practices to reduce risk. Uh, implementation, utilize good grants management and project management principles, innovation and project planning and implementation, new technologies, smart growth, urban planning, design, multi-phase projects, um, the number of population impacted, um, outreach, uh, future conditions, uh, which means consider changes in climate, land use, population and development, and mitigate risk for infrastructure and community lifelines. Some of the challenges we heard from our applications this year was um, that increasing the speed to obligate funding by reducing complexity, uh, that's a common theme and in fact is one of our strategic priorities for FEMA as well. Uh, enhancing communication and training uh, provided to HMA partners and applicants and sub applicants and assessing the impact of HMA programs in increasing national resilience. Next slide, please. So where are we headed? Uh, and I think we are at a critical juncture here uh, as we head into the second year of uh, BRIC. Uh, we have lessons learned obviously from the first year, but FEMA is committed to reducing disaster suffering and our commitment starts with the National Mitigation Investment Strategy the investment strategy frames the initial steps needed to more effectively and efficiently advance the practice of mitigation investment nationwide and to improve collaboration between the federal government and communities, catalyze private and nonprofit sector investments and innovation, make data and risk informed decisions, and ultimately reduce the burden on response and recovery efforts. Uh, FIMA recently used this strategy to develop its own three-year strategy and identify two overarching principles that will influence all of our goals and objectives for the next few years. First, we make a commitment that we will deliver our programs with equity, and next, we will incorporate future conditions, including climate change, into all of our work. So with that commitment, now comes the hard work of understanding how our programs are doing, in terms of equitable program delivery and identifying our next steps to move forward. That process is underway right now, and this includes examining how we identify and assess risk, how we consider equity in community planning and project prioritization, and how we ensure that our grant programs are providing funding and are accessible to those most in need, and increasing the number of people who have insurance and live in communities with adopted and enforced building codes. We know that risks from natural hazards are growing and in tandem, so are the effects of natural disasters on people, community lifelines, businesses and infrastructures. Uh, climate change is expected to worsen uh, the number of natural disasters and which leads to increasing costs and impacts. Elements of the BRIC program are designed to address climate impacts and climate change and we, we continue emphasizing inclusion of nature-based solutions and future conditions in our projects. We are examining funding levels for capacity and cap capability building and looking at how to incorporate a lens of equity in the competition criteria. For the executive orders of President Biden on climate change and equity, we want to prioritize projects going into the future and we want to create a level playing field and equal access to all of our grant programs. And the final slide, please. With that, I thank you all. Uh, my email is included in that. Should you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. And I look forward to the Q&A session following this, this presentation. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Lockyer, for that great presentation. Uh, we have a number of questions rolling in here now. 
And I think that the first one that we'll start out with is, what can you tell us about next year's notice of funding opportunity? Uh, I, I actually began by thanking ASFPM for hosting this event. Can you hear me clearly? Great, thank you. Um, and also uh, that we have a chance to present our uh, programs to the larger community. This is a highlight of our year every year. Um, for the NOFAS for FMA and BRIC, uh, what we are looking forward to this year is the same which we have for the past several years. Based on feedback we have received from all of you, that we would like to have a consistent uh, cycle for funding each year for the non-disaster grants. And we are optimistic that as it clears through DHS and uh, OMB, um, which it is going through right now, we'll be able to announce by the end of August uh, the actual uh, opening of the grant application for 21. Great, thank you. And, and what kind of changes can we anticipate in BRIC next year? Steve, I knew you were going to ask me that question. Uh, we can't share much because obviously we haven't got the NOFO approved yet by all the parties. Uh, but one thing I can tell you is, uh, first, on the positive front, we know that the program will be at least 500 million. Our next presenters uh, are Eric Kenny uh, with uh, CDM Smith, and he is co-presenting with Manny Periton uh, jo uh, and Jordan Williams. Uh, the title of the presentation is Technical Observations from the Inaugural Brick Application Cycles. And a little bit about uh, the lead presenter here, Mr. Kenny. He is a senior project manager with CDM Smith. For the better part of a decade, he has focused on supporting FEMA on a range of tasks, including the Hazard Mitigation Assistance Grant Programs, supporting HMA program improvement and technical and benefit cost analysis reviews of HMA grants. For the last five years has led the contractor support for the national technical review of the non-disaster grants supporting the review of over 1900 applications for the pre-disaster mitigation and flood mitigation assistance programs, as well as hundreds of HMGP applications na nationwide under multiple disaster declarations. Mr. Kenny and Mr. Periton, please take it away. Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Eric Kenny, and I'm presenting with Manny Periton. Together, we're leading the team that is currently working to complete the technical review of BRIC and FMA applications. And by currently, I mean they're literally finalizing reviews as we record and present this. Over the next 20 minutes or so, we're going to build off the information Kai had presented and dive a bit deeper into the technical observations best practices and pitfalls from the FY20 BRIC and FMA cycles. We're going to focus in just on the projects submitted for the cycle, so the numbers we discuss and on the competitive pool of both programs. So with that, what do we see this year? Approximately 750 projects were submitted for a combined federal share of $3.5 billion. Uh, you know, this is compared to the available funding of approximately $700 million. And keep in mind that this funding value includes allocations and set aside, so there's slightly less than that available for the competitive projects. Uh, the main reason I want to start with this slide is to highlight these programs remain significantly oversubscribed and very competitive, and to highlight that these technical reviews are, are just one step on the path to selection. So we'll focus and, and cover technical observations, but certainly paying attention to the notice of funding opportunity it is equally important to make sure your project takes into account the prioritization criteria and is as competitive as possible. Looking a little closer at these 750 projects, um, they came from all, all states and territories, 25 of which submitted projects with a combined federal share of $50 million or greater, and five of those submitted over $200 million in projects. On the FMA side, we saw submittals from 30 states and territories with the total value in applications from two states exceeding $50 million and eight others exceeding 10 million. We're seeing a trend of more applications coming in for larger, more complex projects. The $50 million reflects just the federal share and we frequently see non-federal matches well above 25%, driving up the total project cost. We saw quite a few new or newer things this year. Uh, you know, a new HMA program, innovative project types pulling from the brick mediation action portfolio Know, a focus on nature-based solutions, uh, a number of microgrids. I believe this is the first time we've seen them during the competitive cycle. 
as well as large-scale seismic retrofit projects. We also saw the increased use, to, use of ecosystem services. You know, this is likely driven by the removal of the 0.75 BCR threshold for their inclusion. And with BRIC allowing phased projects, we saw those for the first time, often associated with large-scale flood risk reduction projects. Finally, this is the first year that version 6 of the, the BCA tool was required for all applications, and we transitioned into FEMA Go. So we're working with a new program in a new system with some evol evolving uh, program requirements. That said, the core requirements of the technical review remain the same. You know, the projects need to be technically feasible. The scope, schedule, and budget need to demonstrate a project can be implemented and will achieve the stated risk reduction. And the project needs to be cost effective using a FEMA approved BCA methodology. Either BCA tool version 6.0 or one of the efficiency mechanisms needs to be used. And as always, inputs and assumptions need to be documented and supported to quantify the benefits of the project. So, you know, quite a bit has changed this year. But overall, the same information needs to be provided to support the projects. I do think the challenges have evolved a bit, though, as these projects become larger and more complex. Uh, we see the challenge of translating your project into an HMA fundable sub application and effectively conveying and documenting the risk reduction of that solution. The reviewers are limited by the information provided in the sub-application, so documentation becomes more critical as these projects become more involved and we're all relying on the submitted documentation to understand and evaluate the project. Uh, Manuel will get into some more details on the next few slides, but there are two main points I want to make here, and I know Kaya touched on this a bit as well. Uh, you know, first, the inclusion of some sort of BCA narrative. Something that compiles the key documents, data, and assumptions that connects the dots between the sub-application and the BCA and shows how it all fits together. And second, just the need for consistency and accuracy across the sub-application. Uh, thinking of flood projects, cost effectiveness is very reliant on the base flood elevation or the lowest floor elevation. So a transcription error, say 5.6 feet when you meant 6.5 feet, uh, can mean the difference between a cost-effective project or not. And, and these are errors that we do see. So I'm going to turn it over to Manny to get into some more specifics over the next couple slides. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Before I get started, one thing I want everyone to keep in mind is as we record this session, we're only about halfway through our NTR process. We have reviewed and deliberated recommendations on most FMA projects, Brick, on the other hand, we just, we're just getting started on presenting preliminary recommendation. So it's likely there are additional best practices and lessons learned once we've completed all our Brick reviews. Okay, on to the BCA narrative. In general, I would say these are effective when and a best practice because they provide co context as well as justification for all inputs in the benefit cost analysis. In some cases, we, we see this information and um, we can see maybe the, uh, the sub-applicant transposed the number from, from their documentation into their benefit cost analysis. And when we make that correction for those transposed numbers, the BCR drops below 1. We can look at other assumptions that were made and, and potentially apply a more, uh, a more, more co continue to prov provide a more conservative approach to it. And, and, and in some cases, continue to show the pro product is cost-effective even though there was a, an, an error made. Um, and in other cases, we find assumptions that, that we can apply based on the information provided in that documentation. It also helps us um, um, understand uh, the, the methodology, um, as well as, uh, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the assumptions made during the analysis. And uh, one of the key pieces I would say is referencing the, the files. Uh, you know, and, and naming them for supporting documentation so we know, or, or providing a roadmap for the supporting documentation that was provided for those assumptions. Um, a second area is providing the, the Excel file uh, and source data to generate the BCA. Um, re our reviewers will validate and, uh, the methodology used and, and, and make corrections uh, accordingly. Um, so having that, that BCA helps us with, with that, with that pr process. Um, in some cases, the, the PDF report that's generated by the software can be, uh, can be incomplete. Um, maybe it doesn't, the entire PDF doesn't generate. Uh, a key assumption isn't, uh, isn't documented in, in that PDF. Um, and there's a, there's a key input that's missing that our reviewer cannot verify. Um, and then also it helps us visualize and, and verify how the BCA w w was done. Uh, if, if it was done maybe before a recent software update was released, um, we're actually seeing that uh, this year um, with, uh, with some of the analyses that, that we're doing. 
Uh, some of the BCAs were, were done before a, a software update was done, uh, which is which has impacted the, uh, the the calculations, and uh, we're able to to see that and 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 you know adjust accordingly because of that update. And uh, with respect to attachments, as I was talking earlier about within the BCA narrative about referencing files name for for supporting documentation, you know, try and keep this as clear and consistent as possible. Um, we know we can tell from some of the applications that were submitted multiple uh, versions of some attachments were were were, uh, were attached in in FEMA Go. Uh, maybe folks were updating information. Uh, there was a preliminary design, uh, maybe a thirty percent, and then the sixty percent became available um, during the application development process. So that was that was provided just um, you know the, the the more the clearer the uh, the attachments and the file naming is and, and the more consistent that the, the roadmap is for for pointing to that for supporting documentation um, the, the the better so try to be as, as clear and, and consistent as possible an additional best practice is to include preliminary engineering reports or other technical reports and data FEMA will accept the certified engineering design in lieu of a comprehensive technical feasibility review so this is something we prefer to see we highly encourage if existing designs exist to submit them as part of your application. At least once a year we review an application that references a design that is not submitted with the application and sometimes quite frustrating. If you do not have a, des a design, consider requesting funding for scoping. These can be submitted as an allocation, or in some cases phasing is allowable for brick under the competitive side. Keep in mind if you're phasing, the project should be more than just a concept. The FEMA HMA guidance has some pre-screening criteria which you should consider and comply with. Ultimately, clearly communicate the proposed solution after considering a range of alternatives and communicate phasing is needed to, to support completing the design or other technical information to implement the project. When proposing phasing, we recommend clearly defining milestones and deliverables you anticipate accomplishing along with the performance measures or level of protection desired. For example, the milestones may include a 30, 60, and 90% design that will meet the performance criteria in your state local stormwater management manual or the U.S. Army Corps Engineers Coastal Engineering Manual. Finally, we recommend, highly recommend reading the Notice of Funding Opportunity and take advantage of it. If the NOFO says you will get points for XYZ, focus on incorporating XYZ in order to be more competitive. Can't emphasize enough the importance of knowing what the program priorities are for that year, so we highly encourage you to read that notice of funding opportunity. With increased funding limitations, we are seeing more complex projects. One common challenge is the lack of minimal engineering analyses included, or that the approach is not in line with industry standards. One way we've seen sub-applicants address this is they reference a similar project they've completed, say a school district that has already built a safe room, and they may not have plans for the proposed safe room, but they are familiar with the requirements in FEMA Publication 361, as well as a storm shelter standard developed by the International Code Council, ICC 500. It is essential to communities communicate the level of effectiveness for the project. What are we signing up for, basically? Upon completion, the stormwater management project will result in a system that includes storage to attenuate, say, the 100-year, 24-hour peak discharge rate have closed conveyance components, and, uh, and a new pump station with a generator and controls constructed in accordance with ASC 24. That's one example. The approach should take into account implementation considerations such as historic preservation requirements in older buildings or upstream and downstream impacts. With respect to inaccurate information, two common challenges are recurrence intervals and lowest floor elevation used to estimate um, potential flood damage. A recurrence interval is not the duration between events, nor is it the duration since the last event occurred. Instead, it is representative of the probability that the given event will be equaled or exceeded in any given year. The 2011 FEMA Supplement to BCA Reference Guide has information related to support estimating a recurrence interval. In addition, the BCA tool has an unknown frequency calculator built into it that can help estimate recurrence intervals as long as you have three historical damage events over more than 10 years. With respect to the lowest floor elevations used to estimate flood damage, it is important to explain the basis for the estimate of that lowest floor. For example, one sub-application uh, includes detailed topography collected by LIDAR or other means, then assumes one foot above ground elevation for slab on grade buildings, three feet for those on crawl spaces, and eight feet for those that are clearly elevated, and they include representative buildings to support their assumptions. Similar to recurrence intervals, the 2011 FEMA supplement to the BCA reference guide has information related to support estimating a lowest floor.
Similar to the lowest floor elevation, it is important to ensure you properly apply elevations from the flood insurance studies or other modeling data, particularly water surface elevations which are often used to estimate exposure to flood damage. In addition, when using historical damages, like insurance claims data, it is important to verify those claims are applicable to the project area. Avoid using countywide claims data when, when a project is only benefiting a subdivision. I think an effective tool for this challenge is a benefiting area map, along with a map of before and after mitigation conditions. These tend to help illustrate the effectiveness of the project as well as the applicability of the data provided. On the previous slide, I touched on some of the challenges related to recurrence intervals. We are looking for the probability that the given event will be equaled or exceeded in any given year. This is not the same as the elapsed time between events. In some cases, there may be reports or other data to help estimate the recurrence interval for historic events. And to reinforce a point I made on the previous slide, the BCA tool has an unknown frequency calculator built into it that can help estimate recurrence intervals as long as you have three historical damage events over more than a 10-year period. Finally, with respect to sea level rise, you can incorporate it into your BCA to indicate and illustrate that the increased exposure exists due to flooding, meaning at the same, at the same probability of occurrence or recurrence interval, you are likely to have more damage. With that, with that said, if you're expected to apply the same logic to your design. For example, if you assume the BFE will be one and a half feet higher due to sea level rise over the life of a residential elevation project, then you should be elevating the home to at least a foot and a half above the designed flood elevation. So if you're considering X amount of sea level rise in your BCA, be sure to adjust the design for elevation of the project to at least the BFE plus X feet along with any additional freeboard you may want to incorporate. Now I'll highlight a few final challenges before turning it over to Eric. Related to loss of function, when looking at critical facilities, be sure to incorporate other operational facilities. Most of the methodologies in the BCA tool require you to provide inputs for the next nearest hospital or fire station. We've seen this both over and underestimated. Like other BCA inputs, we often come across values that cannot be verified, nor is there any explanation for available for, for the input. This ties back to the importance of having that BCA narrative I mentioned earlier. When using an operating budget to estimate the loss of function impacts, be careful with applying a state, county, or district-wide budget to a facility. The estimated value should be relative to the operational cost from the facility that is being retrofitted or benefiting from the proposed project. Finally, with respect to loss of function, be sure the value you are using is applicable. We've seen the value of water and wastewater used to estimate the benefits of stormwater project, meaning the BCA used the population served by stormwater project to estimate benefits. Those water and wastewater um, values are intended for loss of function of a utility. Another area of emphasis, and I think this is the third time we've mentioned it in this presentation, is to ensure you are clearly and consistently describing the intended level of protection. Ensure the design, estimated after mitigation damages and the benefit cost analysis, and other supporting documentation and narratives consistently designate that level of protection. Finally, make sure you clearly connect the hazard and the probability of it occurring with the risk reduction project. For example, if you have a project entirely focused on improving stormwater management during future rainfall events, but the recurrence interval is based on coastal storm surge events. Before turning it over to Eric, I want to point you to the HMA technical review job aids the agency has published. I encourage you to reference them. Here's an example of one of the flood risk reduction job aids, which apply to most of the large infrastructure projects we review. These have been out for a few years now, and we are seeing applications with supporting documentation that follow these job aids, and they have been effective at communicating the technical feasibility of the proposed project. Thanks, Manny. You know, a lot of what we discussed is not only applicable to the large infrastructure projects, but also to acquisition, elevation, and mitigation reconstruction projects. And I wanted to spend a little time on those here. You know, two-thirds of the FMA projects and a handful of brick projects were for these project types. Um, so what tends to trip up these projects? Uh, for acquisition projects, it's often su substituting the fair market value where the building replacement value should be. Uh, the cost to replace the structure often differs significantly uh, from what it would cost to purchase the structure. For elevation projects, you know, see a large number of older, you know, perhaps slab on grade structures being elevated, um, often to very high heights, and they often lack documentation confirming that the work can be safely done. We also, and I know Manny touched on this a bit, uh, see a lot of confusion around the lowest floor elevation and how high the structure will be elevated or elevated to. Uh, this can often be a result of misreading the elevation certificate 
or confusing the final elevation height, say two feet above the BFE, with how high the structure will be elevated, perhaps four feet from BFE minus two to BFE plus two. You know, and for mitigation reconstruction, especially where the scope is a bit unclear, you know, is this mitigation reconstruction or an elevation project, there can be confusion around the $150,000 federal share cap. Does it apply to this project? And what costs are subject to that cap? Pre-calculated benefits are, you know, another great tool when, when used correctly. Uh, here I'm focusing on those for acquisition, elevation, and mitigation reconstruction, but they also exist for wind retrofit and non-residential safe rooms. Um, again, these are you know, great tools when used correctly, and we do see some common errors. Um, we see pre-calculated benefits being applied for structures outside the special flood hazard area, or we see structures that are attempting to use the substantial damage waiver approach, uh, either being outside the SFHA or without documentation of the substantial damage determination. Uh, we see aggregation of benefits for structures evaluated with pre-calculated benefits with those evaluated using a traditional BCA or the sharing of benefits between acquisition and elevation projects, uh, neither of which is allowable. Uh, location factors are a great, great way to account for the increased project cost in some areas, uh, but they need to be supported with uh, an appropriate reference. There's not a single required source. We tend to see perhaps the same three or four e each cycle, but it does need to be provided to support that factor. Along those same lines, uh, this cycle we've seen the use of an inflation factor to adjust the pre-calculated benefit, and that's just not an allowable approach. Finally, uh, mitigation reconstruction can use the elevation pre-calculated benefits but that $150,000 federal share cap still applies, so it's important to keep that in mind. To sum it all up, you know, a lot of data goes into these applications, and, and as much as those data can be organized and present a clear roadmap of how the project meets HMA technical requirements, that'll really increase the chances that a project makes it through the technical review. And again, you know, th that's just part of the process. Ma make sure you're considering the NOFO, you know, especially as these projects get more competitive. Keeping in mind those priorities uh, will ultimately increase the chance that a project gets selected and funded. Thanks for your time this afternoon. We hope um, we've been able to clearly summarize what we're seeing as some of the primary best practices and pitfalls, and we welcome any questions you may have. Uh, we're also you know, interested in understanding what could be done to help make this application development and review process easier to navigate. You know, are, are there tools, guidance, or additional different feedback that would be useful in the review memos? Um, so really welcome, again, any questions you may have or comments. Thank you, and um, we'll open it up for questions. Thank you, Eric and Manny, for that very informative presentation. Uh, we have a few questions that have come in here over the chat, and I'll start with, we find in applications to our state, uh, which is California, that applicants often do not provide their existing conditions slash risk information, such as inundation maps or special flood hazard area. Are you finding this is a nationwide issue? Good. Um, I'll, I'll take this one. Uh, yes, we do. And uh, we see this across all hazards, for that matter. For, for us, uh, we see this uh, map, an inundation map that uh, the question is being asked from uh, as kind of vulnerability assessment. Uh, so, you know, we see an H&H &H study for a watershed that helps us see what the current conditions are and then hopefully with the modeling, what the after conditions are. Same thing applies for buildings. Uh, we see buildings that are proposed to be retrofitted and we have no idea what the existing conditions are like. So it is, a, I would say it is a challenge if you would uh, nationwide and across multi-hazards as well. It's always a challenge uh, when you submit these applications, when they leave the community or state, you always have to write them like the person that's going to end up making the funding decision doesn't know a thing about it because nine times out of 10, they don't. And so uh, it's always best to include more detail than, than not. Uh, another question here is, can you give an example of how to incorporate or demonstrate positive climate change impact when submitting an application? Sure. So I guess what, what comes to mind for me, and I don't know if it's the context of the question, but, uh, you know, from a climate change standpoint, we think a lot about sea level rise and, uh, and, and, and greater flood uh, risk, if you would. And uh, we see that incorporated into some of the flood risk reduction projects, whether they be a drainage project or, a, I would say, a residential elevation project. Um, the key thing, I think, with that is to, to make sure, one, you document the basis for, for why you pick the amount of, let's say, sea level rise. But, but more than anything, secondly, is 
make sure your project incorporates it. Like don't say your, your risk or your hazard is that much greater, but you're still going to design to the current, let's say BFE um, type thing. So make sure you're incorporated into it. And um, in terms of demonstrating positive climate change, the one thing that comes to mind now is a new policy, uh, you know, from an environmental standpoint, environmental benefits standpoint. I know there are some that are out there. So if that's, uh, if that's something that you're incorporating into your, your project to help with, with uh, reducing the impacts of climate change, you're allowed to, to count those benefits uh, um, um, more than you were in the past. So hopefully that helps a little bit with that question, Steve. Okay. So, so one thing I was curious about, uh, along with the new grant program uh, last year at BRIC, we also had a new online application system to take those grant applications and FEMA Go. And whereas uh, historically we've always used e-grants. And I'm just curious if you noticed a difference in some of the issues or problems that you were seeing uh, with the grant applications when you had a switch from e-grants to FEMA Go. Sure, and, and I, can, I can address that one. I, th I think overall we, you know, we, we liked working in FEMA Go. Um, I think a couple of the you know, key things that we saw as definitely an improvement from e-grants is the ability for just more of a narrative. There's a lot more free form text fields uh, that allowed folks to enter a lot more information there just in the application itself about what, they're, you know, what the project is. And that really allowed us to get a, a better understanding without, without clicking through each attachment initially. Um, so, you know, more details is, is always well, mostly better. I would definitely say it was, you know, kind of another area where consistency across the application became more important as there was more opportunities to put text in there as opposed to just a, a scope of work attachment, uh, we did notice instances where, you know, there might be an inconsistency in say the level of protection or, uh, or the pump size or, or the sea level rise being addressed. Um, so I think that was overall, you know, an improvement. I think we enjoyed the fact that there was a better visibility of attachments. It was a lot easier to see um, everything that was attached um, and find those rather than navigating through e-grants, which I think we're all familiar with. And, you know, it's, it has its moments when you're trying to find every attachment, especially if there's a large file in there. Um, so yeah, I, I think overall, you know, the, the interface was a lot more user-friendly. I, I think one thing that we saw, and actually I saw another question about was, you know, the ability not to delete an attachment. Um, but something that we saw that was very helpful was we'd see comments of, if perhaps there were two BCA files attached, uh, a comment saying disregard, and that allowed us and our reviewers to know what, what is the intended BCA file and, and which attachments are actually relevant to the application rather than trying to uh, figure out what the difference is between three files with a, with a very similar name. So um, overall, the ability to add comments and additional text, I think was a, a great improvement. Great, thank you. Okay. Uh, I believe that we were able to get uh, Kayed Lakia back on the line, and there were a few questions uh, that we were going to throw to him to answer. Kayed, can you hear me? Yes, I can. And can you hear and see me? Yes. All right. Great. Thank, thank you. I apologize for the technical difficulties earlier. And thank you, Steve, Eric, and Manny for being flexible here. <laughs> so first up here, with almost seven times more funding requested than was allocated in BRIC, 2020, it appears there's a huge need and interest for the BRIC program. Are there conversations at the federal level to increase the scope and or funding of BRIC and, and similar? Great question, Stephen. Absolutely. Nothing would please me more than greater amount of mitigation each year, uh, as you know. Um, this is a trend we have seen, though, for the past several years. Whether we started with a $25 million PDM program about five years ago, or the $200 million program across FMA and, and uh, over the last few years, we have seen demand two and a half to three times uh, that amount. So absolutely, um, we are trying to balance two, thing, uh, two things. One thing which you may be aware of is the way the 6% for the brick is calculated is a direct result of the disaster activity occurring uh, each year. Last year, as you know, due to COVID, as well as the number of hurricanes, we have the extremely busy and large disaster year. So we know that our current uh, proposal is to make sure that we at least have 500 million for next year's uh, grant funding, but based on uh, our discussions with uh, OMB and others, that pie could be larger, but we don't know that yet. Uh, but certainly the demand is out there 
for all of you to do a larger amount of funding. Great. Uh, so uh, historically, I guess an issue uh, with the PDM program was uh, earmarks. And uh, earmarks uh, happened there for a number of years and they were Congress kind of stopped them uh, from happening out of the PDM program. And I have a question here about uh, th th that apparently they reemerged through the BRIC program. And I'm wondering if you might address that. Uh, yes, actually, and without getting into a lot of the details, uh, yes, it is something which did emerge this year again at the request of Congress. Um, the House Appropriation Committee provided congressional members until April 16th, um, that is last month, uh, to, uh, to submit uh, earmark projects. Um, and that period was extended until April 30th. Uh, to submit the request along with a letter supporting as to why this project would be a suitable project and it would meet uh, some of the eligibility criteria. Uh, to the credit of Congress, one of the things we requested and they uh, paid attention to us is that uh, let's make sure that we fund mitigation projects. So one of the suggestions we had was, um, could we make sure that the BRIC eligibility criteria is followed for these earmark projects as well? And that's certainly the case. We want to fund good mitigation. And that's what our aim is through these earmark projects as well. Thank you. OK, well, thank you all. Uh, we're out of time for questions. Uh, but thank you very much uh, for your presentations and uh, popping back in to answer a few more questions. And uh, we'll go on to our next presentation. Our, our next presenter is Mr. Uh, Chris Levitz with AECOM and Sarah Murdoch with the Nature Conservancy. Uh, the title of their presentation is Making Nature-Based Solutions Possible with Hazard Mitigation Funding. The Nature Conservancy is working with AECOM to further a collective understanding and approach to capturing FEMA hazard mitigation assistance funding for nature-based solutions. TNC and AECOM are developing a guidebook to help communities plan, apply for, and fund nature-based solutions. And so we're looking forward to this presentation uh, from Mr. Levitz, who is a coastal engineer and resilience manager in the Houston AECOM office. He has 15 years experience with a focus on planning and engineering efforts that develop ecological and community resilience specifically related to river, rain, urban, and coastal flood risk. Mr. Levitz. Hi, my name is Sarah Murdoch, and I direct the U.S. Climate Resilience and Water Policy for the Nature Conservancy. Thanks for joining us for the session today titled Making Nature-Based Solutions Possible with Hazard Mitigation Funding. I'm joined today by Chris Levitz, the Gulf Coast Coastal Engineering and Resiliency Manager at AECOM. I'm going to kick things off and then hand that over to Chris for the remainder of the presentation. So the threat is evident. Climate change combined with development in risk prone areas is leading to escalating impacts from floods and wildfires and other impacts throughout the world. The traditional response to disasters and investment of federal disaster funding is to rush to build back, to get things back to what they were before pre-disaster. The response is understandable, a desire for communities to get back to normal. Um, yet we know that this misses a significant opportunity to use federal funding to reimagine and invest in solutions that deliver greater, more sustainable, more resilient outcomes in the face of continued disaster threats. A solution that the Nature Conservancy would like communities to consider is investing in nature. So-called nature-based solutions should be considered either in and of themselves or in conjunction with more traditional great infrastructure projects particularly when thinking about mitigating flooding and wildfire. The essential component of nature-based solutions, the terms um, natural infrastructure and green infrastructure are also used, is that they enhance natural ecosystems to, mit to mitigate 
disasters and hazards. A core tenant is that nature-based solutions offer multiple benefits, environmental, economic, and societal benefits. As compared to gray infrastructure, which is often designed and built to address one challenge and often undermines environmental or, or other societal benefits. There are examples of this work now all across the US in all types of ecosystems, from coastal wetland restoration to enhance the scale and health of wetlands, to levee setbacks that reconnect floodplains to rivers, reducing flood risk to sustainable forest management designed to reduce wildfire risk. A goal of TNC has been to socialize what we mean by nature-based solutions and to make the case for these solutions by actually investing in and developing many varied types of projects in various ecosystems and geographies and contributing to the science that measures the multiple benefits of this work, including the risk reduction benefits. The work that Chris will be talking about today came about because we saw an opportunity and a need. We had long been advocating that FEMA invest greater mitigation funding in nature-based strategies, that they promote this as an allowable category of mitigation work. We've also been long advocating that greater pre-disaster mitigation funding is needed. So when the Stafford Act Amendment passed Congress, creating the new FEMA Building Resilient Infrastructure Communities Program, the BRIC program, which will result in much greater funding being available for pre-disaster mitigation. And FEMA did promote nature-based solutions as an allowable use of the program launch. We saw a need now to turn our attention to state and communities and eligible applicants who will be applying for this funding. We saw a need to continue to promote nature-based solutions, but also really dig into and address the unique aspects and challenges that these projects face in the FEMA BRIC, as well as the hazard mitigation grant and flood mitigation grant programs. We hired AECOM to draft this guidebook with us, wanting to create a resource and a tool for communities to help provide them with the information needed to assess project options, provide guidance on what project information they would need for an application, and also key information on application process, key points of contact, process dynamics. Ultimately, it is drafted to guide a successful FEMA mitigation grant application. It digs into unique challenges of conducting a benefit cost analysis for nature-based projects, which is required by FEMA, and provides detailed case studies of projects that have successfully secured various types of federal funding, including FEMA funding. Our vision is to educate communities and provide information and guidance to increase the success in drawing FEMA mitigation funding for nature-based projects. If anyone would like a copy of the guidebook, please don't hesitate to email me and I'll be happy to share. The goal is to share it widely and to have it be a useful tool for eligible applicants. I'll now turn it over to Chris to walk us through the guidebook contents and focus on some of the unique challenges related to nature-based projects securing FEMA mitigation funding. We'd like to thank AECOM for their dedication to this project and the excellent work. They have been a wonderful partner in helping us create this resource. Chris, over to you. Thank you, Sarah. I really appreciate you covering the beginning of this presentation, introducing the concept of nature-based solutions to our audience. Um, and I really appreciate the work that Nature Conservancy is doing to promote these types of um, activities across the country and to a wide range of stakeholders. So I'm going to go into um, just a little bit more detail on the FEMA Hazard Mitigation Assistance Programs um, on this next slide. And then after that, go through some of the steps that we outlined in the guidebook that Sarah has, has shown and alluded to earlier. Um, so to begin with, uh, pre-disaster and post-disaster are both separate funding streams that come through FEMA. 
Um, and we cover them both in the in the guidebook. Um, Pre-disaster is covered by the BRIC program as well as the FMA, the Flood Mitigation Assistance Program. Um, we really go into probably the most specifics on BRIC. It is has the most um, accommodations to work towards nature-based solutions for hazard mitigation, but um, both programs have opportunities for funding, some differences between them. BRIC is a larger program with more funding, um, but at the same time that makes it more competitive um, and has more applications towards it. So, um, so there's multiple considerations there. In addition, there's the post-disaster funding through the hazard mitigation pro grant program, which um, you know coincides with disaster declarations and has restrictions on when those funds are available. But when they do become available, it's, a, it's an excellent uh, source of funding as well. So, um, so really what we talk about throughout the rest of this presentation in the guidebook is applicable to all the programs. Um, in most cases, and with a special emphasis on BRIC. So um, really the way we structure this discussion here and a lot of the, the actual guidebook itself is introducing these programs, you know, and understanding is what, what the need is, um, what's driving, you know, what, what type of hazard is it and what program fits that hazard as far as for your needs, as well as follow, or followed by the mitigation techniques. What are some of the nature-based solutions that could be applicable and when do different ones apply? Um, quantifying those benefits, Sarah alluded to the challenges of the benefit cost analysis and developing that as part of your application. Um, that's almost always gonna be one of the most challenging parts of an application process. So we're gonna quickly touch on some of the basic topics. Um, here, it's, it's, there's, there's a lot of you know, gray area there, so it's really hard to go into a, a ton of detail for every situation. I do want to touch on some of the overarching concepts there. And then lastly, approach and strategy. Some of the some of the specifics and some of the kind of tips and tricks of how to think about these projects and applications and also pitfalls to avoid. Um, so with that, I'm going to start by talking about um, what 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 our steps are and how we how do we address this. So you know, as, as discussed, first thing is understanding what's the need. So what is the hazard that's being uh, mitigated? Once you understand that, um, well, what potential nature-based solutions can be developed to address that hazard? Um, and so that's kind of almost like the alternative analysis. What, what, what choices do you have there? And then you want to screen those alternatives for understanding those local conditions. Um, sometimes you may have a general type of project or solution that may not work as well for a specific community or location or site characteristics. Um, and once you've kind of done that screening, you know, you want to then prioritize um, based off of, you know, some of the secondary benefits. Now, that's under the assumption that you've identified solutions that can and will meet the quantified um, benefit thresholds with the BCA analysis. Um, so it's really kind of that separating um, some of those that, that achieve the base goal, which ones that have some of these ancillary benefits, some of these qualitative benefits that really support it. And once you've done all of those things, um, you know, which solution is most likely to receive funding? And if you go through those steps, um, in theory, you should really be at that point. So understanding the hazard. <clears throat> um, knowing, knowing what the problem is as you go there. And Sarah alluded to the to flooding, um, both riverine and coastal, as well as wildfire. We're not gonna go into a much detail here on wildfire, given that this is for ASFPM, but um, most of these concepts that are covered for flooding are also applicable for wildfire. There's some differences in, in funding. Um, it's also worth noting, as we talk about comprehensive solutions, that uh, in some of the regions in the of the country that addressing and mitigating wildfire also does provide uh, flood hazard risk reduction um, subsequently. So um, understanding your, your risk, understanding your hazard, um, you know, on the, if, it's, if it's traditional flooding, not coastal, you have kind of the difference between riverine, which is fluvial, um, and then urban, which is pluvial. And urban's a more complex situation. A lot of times there's a lot more detail on what could cause localized flooding. Um, and so there's different solutions for that. Um, similarly, when you go coastal, storm surge is a completely different um, mechanism causing flooding in the coast. There's a, it's a much more high energy scenario in most cases. And so different solutions are required there as well. 
So once you've understand your hazard, you know, you really want to move on to mitigate mitigation techniques. Um, so for, for riverine and urban flooding, um, there's a range of concepts that can be applied. Um, and there's a couple of things I just want to touch on here. Um, you see something listed here like culvert upgrades and you think, well, that's a traditional civil, traditional structural type of solution. Why is that listed as nature-based solution? Um, it's, it's important to, um, look at some of these solutions in the big picture, you know, a lot of development historically over the last many, many decades has changed the hydrologic patterns of watersheds. It's cut off traditional or natural flows. Um, and uh, restoring some of those natural patterns is critical in a lot of these areas. Um, and so while the solution may require something like a culvert, the in the driving force and the end goal is to restore those natural flows. And so it's important to keep those kind of things in mind um, that nature-based solutions doesn't mean just green. Um, you know, to, to achieve that natural solution, sometimes it's that combination or that use of, of more built infrastructure to that goal. Um, another important one and something that's important is the horizontal setback levees um, along with like floodplain restoration. These these are becoming um, critical critical activities, um, taking some of that more regulated um, infrastructure where, where straight levees or, was or rivers were channelized um, for flood protection and understanding that when possible, expanding that floodplain, um, giving those for the secondary flood zones um, that are more ecologically sound um, and provide that additional storage, um, remove communities and structures from that hazard are, are really an important way to implement nature-based nature, nature solutions. Um, so along the coast, when you talk about uh, storm surge, it becomes challenging a lot of the time because storm surge is so powerful. Um, so in a lot of cases, when Sarah mentions, you know, hybrid solutions, you know, I think the coast is really a candidate for hybrid solutions a lot of the time because you're not going to be able to alter storm surge by simply uh, restoring reef or putting in a breakwater with vegetation behind it. Um, storm surge is just too, there's too much force. Now, one of the good parts about this is, you know, with beaches and dunes, beaches and dunes, especially dune restoration, is a significant deterrent in an ability to mitigate storm surge. Um, there's a lot of ability to absorb that energy um, in, in essentially that natural system that's also in a lot of cases capable of restoring itself post storm. So, um, so that is that is a nature based solution that that can handle um, a lot a lot of force. Um, but sometimes it's coupling and making those hybrid solutions where you do have a more built solution, and then you could have something like wetland restoration, living shorelines, um, things like that that supplement and provide secondary protection from um, resulting. Uh, wave and wind action on say our bays after you've gone gone past a barrier island or a peninsula or something along those lines so so once you've kind of evaluated what potential solutions are out there what, how can we integrate and make nature-based solutions at the core of our approach um, well now you have to quantify those benefits and this is where it can get challenging and difficult um, and this is really you know often the the difference between a successful project application and not um, because this is it's very yes or no. You either you're either able to provide a benefit cost analysis that meets the, the needs or you can't. Um, so first understanding project costs, depending on your solution, there could be an array of costs depending you know that from the high end to the low end for those different solutions. But then understanding your benefits. Um, as much as possible, you wanna you wanna try and achieve that through the B, FEMA BCA tool, um, which has a lot of those traditional benefits built into it. Um, but there is an ability to bring in benefits that aren't within the tool. But but um, in most cases, those are not going to be your primary benefits. Those would be secondary. Um, your primary benefits are going to usually be captured under that, that tool through these traditional um, benefits. So things like, you know, most of these projects for hazard mitigation through FEMA are going to re require some kind of substantial amount of physical damage risk reduction. So removing structures from risk. Um, you know, loss of function. So if you have significant roadways, rail lines, um, means of operating business and, you know, or even for uh, emergency use and safety when it comes to casualties and loss of life, you know, that kind of impact and reducing those kind of impacts is going to really be the driving force for a successful application. Um, one nice thing is with nature-based solutions, 
you know, you're going to still need to check the box with those traditional benefits, but it also provides avenues towards things like, you know, these ecosystem space, you know, creation and, and restoration um, that that will only provide additional benefits beyond what you had anyway. So it's it's a kind of a cherry on top in a lot of ways. Um, and so once you quantify your benefits, you know, you really want to then look at the qualitative benefits. So for programs like BRIC, where it's competitive, uh, once you have that BCA where you need it, you still have to go and show a project that it stands out from the competition in a lot of ways. And so qualitative benefits are how you can usually do that. And there's they have scoring um, with different categories that will allow you to, to highlight things like nature-based solutions and uh, other community benefits that don't fall under traditional quanti- quantified benefits. So under this, things like on the riverine and flooding side, um, you know, we talk about... Um, being able to have projects that that are functional now and in the future. So things like looking at increased um, rainfall intensity down the road and how how can a project adapt to that? Is it have a, is it going to be functional if you see increases in those risks? Um, and that's a big part of um, you know a lot of these. You know when you talk about stabilization, do you have a project that can function now and in the future? And you want to really highlight that ability for your project to adapt. And a lot of times that's where uh, these nature-based solutions really shine is the ability to adapt and, and maintain resilience in the long term with changing conditions. Same thing on the coast. Um, you know, how do you, you is it stabilizing the shoreline, um, pre- preventing future you know erosion, preventing development in high hazard areas? Um, I mentioned a moment ago, maybe attenuating and reducing some of that uh, residual wave risk that's developing in the bay after the primary storm surge is mitigated. Um, all of those things provide those additional qualitative benefits. Um, along those lines are co-benefits and, fem- and the community lifelines as outlined in the BRIC program. So creating uh, economic opportunities, social vulnerability, you know, equitable solutions is a big uh, factor. You know, there's a lot of emphasis on that lately. So if there's opportunities and, and a focus on making these equitable solutions that benefit um, different social classes and portions of a community. That's an important thing to note. Um, and you can see the icons there for the community lifeline. So pro- adding those into your considerations of how you're going to provide those types of benefits through your project for communities um, can really help a project stand out as well. And the last thing I want to touch on is the approach and strategy. So, uh, you know, it's just little things that might help a project stand out. And some of the stuff that we've seen for advantages is, is just stepping outside your, your uh, maybe your normal space and understanding the big picture of a project and thinking about if you scale up, are you going to capture additional benefits? Um, obviously, if you scale up a project, you may see additional project costs. Um, but do the increasing benefits outweigh that increasing cost? Um, along those lines, sometimes when you start looking at the scale up, you start to understand that there may be opportunities to increase your stakeholder group, your project partners. Um, and, and increasing that not only provides other avenues for helping to fund match project matches and things like that, um, but it also increases your benefits. It also shows well um, to, to the reviewers of these project applications to show that you are working towards a, um, a more holistic, comprehensive solution. And then same thing with residual benefits. Um, thinking about what else is your project doing that's positive, you know, things that you may not think of, maybe you're focused on the ecological side, but you step back and you realize, oh, this is gonna provide um, additional storage for the community uh, upriver or downriver or um, along the coastline nearby, it's gonna you know, provide additional shoreline stabilization for them as well. So anytime you can think of um, some of these residual benefits and how you can incorporate um, more into it and more of those benefits, it's always a positive. The flip side of that is what pitfalls can you avoid? Um, so things like uh, understanding that while qualitative and some of these ancillary benefits are fantastic and help with scoring, you have to address those quantified benefits first. Those have to take priority. Uh, understanding that for large scale uh, flood hazard risk reduction that you're gonna likely need in that planning phase and project development phase large-scale modeling to support it. Um, hopefully there's opportunities to leverage existing modeling, whether it's from FEMA, the Corps of Engineers, or other studies that have been done. 
Um, but just understand that that's gonna that's going to be um, in most cases necessary because that's the technical basis to justify those benefits you're showing. Um, you know, we talked briefly about showing both current and long-term hazard protect hazard um, protection and risk reduction. So you need a project that has that big picture in mind. And then um, one key thing to understand is with some of these levy projects and others, you run into an issue of um, potentially potentially having a federal project overlap with your project or your project's part of a federal project. And then there's some FEMA um, HMA funding restrictions that where they may not be eligible projects at that point. So important to keep that in mind. So with that, I'm going to wrap this up and um, tell you guys, thank you for, for tuning in. And we hope uh, to hear from you in the question and answer session. And um, thank you so much to Sarah and Nature Conservancy as well. Um, as our other contributors, Nate, Taylor, and Erica, who aren't a part of the presentation, but definitely helped us put this together. So um, thank you so much, everybody. And we hope this was helpful and we look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris and Sarah, for that great presentation. Uh, we have a few questions here. Um, I guess the first one that I was thinking uh, was that, you know, the, the mitigation project process starts with mitigation planning. And in Ohio, that's coordinated by county uh, EMA directors, and they may not always be kind of nature-based minded. They may be more, we need to get the water out of here quickly, green, or, uh, you know, uh, bricks and mortar type infrastructure folks. And I'm just wondering if you had any thoughts around how to get nature-based oriented people involved in the mitigation planning process early on to kind of plant those seeds of the importance of uh, these types of green solutions so that uh, they can carry on up through the project uh, and eventually get funded. Um, so I'll, I'll take a stab at that. Thanks for that question. That's a, it's a really good question. Um, it's something that the Nature Conservancy has focused on a lot um, in terms of really thinking about the, the hazard mitigation plans and trying to make sure that nature-based considerations are woven into and, and brought into those plans. Um, and as you say, the folks who are putting those together usually um, don't have kind of ecological backgrounds and this definitely you know, isn't top of mind for them. Um, so a couple things, one, um, We've done our own training internally to, to have our folks understand how to reach out to and talk to um, more the emergency managers or the schmoes or you know, some of these key folks who are integral to FEMA grant process at the state level. Um, and so the guidebook does capture some of that um, in terms of kind of as I alluded to in the in my intro, you know, processes and and um, kind of key key people in the process. But you're exactly right. I think another role we try to play is bridging that divide um, and bringing in maybe state state or local floodplain folks to um, to you know to meet up with their emergency management folks because oftentimes they can deliver that kind of information and perspective. Um, but it, it really does take kind of collaborative uh, bringing folks with different disciplines together um, and, um, and, you know, kind of holistic planning processes really help do that. Um, so that, that's, uh, you know, really important to kind of bridge those different disciplines and folks who wear different hats. Great. Thank you very much. Another question. Is, what are some of the, the more frequent or common type of obstacles that you've encountered in trying to get nature-based solutions funded, uh, not only through the FEMA grant programs, but maybe other grant programs as well? Um, so I'll, I'll step in and, and, and start there. I think one of the biggest challenges with nature-based solutions is, and this might also kind of touch on one of the other questions that was asked about um, you know, the, you know, the economic viability of, of nature-based solutions. A lot of the value when we see with nature-based solutions comes not only in the present, but also in the future conditions. Um, you know, uh, when we talk about hybrid solutions, a lot of time that structural, more kind of gray side of it addresses the, the need 
the need now, but there's there's difficulty for those kind of solutions to adapt and change and, and be viable long term. And then you have to come and you look at, you know, either um, retrofit or entirely redoing projects. Whereas one of the goals with doing nature based solutions is pr developing a project that that is adaptable and sustainable over time and more resilient. Um, but because of that, it's also harder to justify a lot of times those benefits when it comes to federal programs, given the, the focus on current conditions, which, um, which is understandable and, and, it, and it, there's reasons for it being that way. Um, but some of those benefits that you, you know as a community or a group of community or stakeholder that are out there um, become harder, harder to capture because of that, um, you know, things like future development that hasn't occurred. And, and there's some ways of capturing that to an extent, but a lot of that's not not totally possible under the current format to, to realize. Um, and so a lot of times nature-based solutions, you know, are, are work in progress along with community planning and development. And so it's those changes that are less tangible in the current, but more in the future. I think that's where it's hardest. Um, and, there, and there's work to be done to try and make sure we can capture those kind of benefits, because that's really where nature-based solutions seem to stand out. Okay, thanks, Chris. Uh, I'm wondering if uh, you might offer up some recommendations for perhaps how some of the, the FEMA programs specifically might be uh, changed or modified to maybe uh, better uh, uh, to, to uh, fund nature-based solutions over gray uh, solutions. And, and I'll give you a, maybe an example is that uh, I know that you get points in the application for, for uh, having a nature-based solution, but maybe those could be increased or if you have other, those types of recommendations. Yeah, I, you know, it, it's challenging. I don't know, Sarah, I know um, I might hand off to you and yeah, I know you work on, on that side of it, the equation with FEMA. So I don't know if you have anything off the top of your head. Yeah, I mean, uh, so I, I work on federal policy. So my role is to kind of think about some of these changes that will be helpful in the long term. And, you know, it's been brought up a lot, but the benefit cost analysis um, process is, is very cumbersome and it's very challenging and it's pretty technical. Um, and so that brings up both equity issues for communities that are smaller or rural or disadvantaged being able to um, go through that process um, and, and um, successfully put forth projects. Um, so we do think there are ways to revise benefit cost um, methodology further. Um, FEMA's done some great work to, to make some changes and try to open it up for nature-based projects, but there, there's definitely more um, that can be done, especially to address the equity issues related to um, advancing projects. I agree, and thank you for that. And that's actually a perfect uh, lead into our last question here is, can you give us some examples of successful NBS projects that have been built or funded in smaller communities, perhaps like 30,000 or less? I have one example, Chris, I don't know if you have. No, go ahead. Well, we did one project I know in a community called Bayou Labatry in, in um, Alabama, a uh, project called Lightning Point in a place called Lightning Point. Um, it was not FEMA funded, so I don't know if this is a great example because it wasn't, but it was, um, it did have some federal resources. Uh, it might have been um, Gulf um, uh, spill funded. Um, and, and so it did have some federal resources that went into it. Oftentimes, um, one of the roles that the Nature Conservancy plays is trying to look at cobbling together different sources of funding. And so we do play that role in certain communities um, and, and try to look for these places where, you know, our expertise and input could be really helpful um, uh, to help, you know, provide some of nonprofit private funding as well. We did put some of our own money into that project as well. Yeah, and just to, I think one quick note on along those lines too. What we've seen is um, like up in Washington, the I think it's floodplain by design program, which there's a large ecological focus, but it's it's really um, there's been a lot of success because of exactly what you just said, Sarah. There's a collaboration essentially at the state level to, to and they're working to leverage that for federal dollars, and so it requires that broader stakeholder group 
even for the small communities along those rivers to, to be successful. Um, and I think that's the biggest challenge with the small stakeholders is, is forming those, those groups um, that can really leverage projects. Yeah. Great, thank you guys for uh, answering those questions and thank you uh, for your presentation and to all of our presenters uh, today. And thank you again uh, to CDM Smith for uh, sponsoring uh, this particular uh, uh, set of presentations here. So that concludes uh, this uh, series. And uh, thank you all for uh, selecting this presentation and look forward to seeing you all tomorrow virtually. <laughs>